here. I'm Eileen Jang Lynch, curator of visual arts at Wave Hill. I'm an Asian American woman with olive colored skin, dark brown hair, dark brown eyes. I'm wearing dangling white and silver earrings and I'm wearing a blue blazer with a white blouse underneath. So we're so excited to have you here to join us for Beyond Sight Eco Urgency with Lionel Cruet and Nikki Enright and Jesse Bandler Firestone. This is in conjunction with our current exhibition, Eco Urgency Now or Never. It's a two part exhibition that Wave Hill has organized in partnership with Lehman College Art Gallery, also in the Bronx. The show unpacks various artists' responses to our current ecological crises. Part one, now, of Eco Urgency is on view at Wave Hill through December 5th. And part two, or never, opens at Lehman College Art Gallery in December and will run through April 23rd in uh, 2022. So before we begin, I would just like to do an accessibility check. Today, we have a few options for participation. You can ask a question using the chat function. For those dialing in, if you wanna ask a question, you can also email visualarts at wavehill.org. You may either answer some questions during the conversation or towards the end of the program. If you raise your hand, we can also call on you and un unmute you. Sure. We are not providing ASL interpretation, sure. but are using closed captioning through Zoom. To start closed captions, please press the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Everybody make sure you have your mute, your Zoom mute. I'm going to be placing uh, some shortcuts, some keyboard shortcuts in the chat as well. And now I'm going to read a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the traditional ancestral unceded homelands of the Lenape, the Munse, the Manhattan, the Canarsi, the Matinecock, the Shinnecock, and other indigenous nations. We respect that many indigenous people continue to live and work on this land and recognize their ongoing contributions to the region. We also acknowledge the enslaved Africans whose labor built and developed the Northeast during the colonial era and beyond. So I'm pleased to introduce again, Jesse Banner firestone Curatorial Assistant at Wave Hill. And Jesse, I'll let you take it from here. Great, thank you so much, Eileen. Uh, as Eileen mentioned, my name is Jesse Firestone. I'm the Curatorial Assistant here. Uh, I'm a Jewish American. Uh, I've got sort of short beard today um, and also kind of short brown hair with some grays in it blue eyes and I'm wearing um, a black denim turtleneck and I don't know if it's super visible but I'm wearing an earring from my left earlobe that's uh, silver and it is um, a potato chip bag so it says potato chips on it um, and I think before I begin and bring on uh, our first artist Nikki Enright I want to just uh, go over sort of the format of today because there are some new faces here um, so essentially what will happen is there are about seven slides in this PowerPoint um, and I will read a description of each slide to sort of give a visual framework and reference of what we're looking at. Um, and then throughout the description of the artworks as well, please interject at any moment if you have questions or want clarification. Um, I'll also build in moments for that and simply say, hey, does anybody um, want clarification for this? Uh, and then there will be opportunities uh, to ask the artist questions directly. Um, and then I may also have some questions for the artists. And this is really an opportunity to learn about their work. Um, we'll talk about the process as well. Um, but this program is really for, for you all here in attendance. So please like jump in, unmute yourself, ask questions. Um, and we're, we're really excited um, to be here with you all. So um, before I bring on Nikki, I just want to describe the first slide that we're looking at. Uh, the slide is mostly gray and white. On the left-hand side is a photograph of Nikki Enright's artwork, What on Earth Have You Done? Featuring the words, What on Earth Have You Done? Written in black, directly onto a white wall, and repeated six times. On the right-hand side of the PowerPoint slide are the white letters that read, Beyond Sight, Eco-Urgency. 
art through verbal descriptions, interpretation, and conversation. So Nikki, before we start talking and reading about your work, I'd love for you to come on, introduce yourself to the audience, and we can kind of dive in. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Jesse, and thank you, um, Gabriel and Eileen and Wave Hill for doing this. I'm happy. I'm so happy to be here and do my first time doing an artist talk for visually impaired people. It's very exciting and interesting. And, and my fellow artist Lionel is here. So um, I'm Nikki Enright, and I'm a brown skin Latino with uh, salt and pepper hair. I'm wearing a white guayabera shirt, which is a collared shirt with uh, kind of like uh, white stripes on it and a blue shirt that says tomorrow without the O's, like a Arabic or, or a Hebrew writing with no vowels, tomorrow. And um, I have uh, some rings and some cuffs and I'm in my, my uh, living room studio, which behind me is a painting I made, a guitar, a bass guitar, a computer, a desk, and that's it. Great, thanks, Nikki. Um, so I'm gonna move to the second slide and read a description of that slide. Um, and so the way we format this stuff is that it's first sort of a framework of how the work is installed. And then we will read a detailed description of the artwork. Um, and then again, at any moment, you can ask questions or sort of interject as you need. So I'm on the second slide now. Uh, so taken just above eye level, this is a photograph of the entryway into Glendor. It is no more than 10 feet by 10 feet. The entry features curved walls on both sides, creating a circular waiting room that is lit with both natural light and a fluorescent bulb overhead, creating a crisp but warm tone. The main component of this image is Nikki Enright's artwork, What on Earth Have You Done? Featuring those same words written in matte black ink directly onto the wall and repeated six times. The artwork is also installed on the curved wall opposite this one, flanking the visitors on either side. Each curved wall has two alcoves built in, creating recesses that distort the words. There are also decorative elements all around the entryway, including a sculpted molding that creates a type of frame around the, word, the words. On either side of the image's borders are brown lines that are cropped pieces of wood from the doors that enter and exit into the foyer. Are there any questions about sort of the architectural setting that this work exists within? So I'm gonna to move to the third slide and this will be a little bit longer of a description um, and we're gonna describe the actual work now. What on earth have you done is a text-based wall painting created directly on two curved white walls in the entrance vestibule of Glendor Gallery. The colloquial expression, what on earth have you done is painted on both walls across from each other and drawn right over and inside the two alcoves that each wall has. The phrase is repeated six times with each phrase on top of another. Each line when read out loud is phonetically distinct due to the use of italics. For example, in the first line, the word what is italicized. In the second line, the word on is italicized and so on until the sixth line where the last word done is italicized. Therefore, the piece reads as such, what on earth have you done? 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 Are there any questions sort of about that description um, or a clarification I can offer anybody? So because the phrases are stacked on top of one another, if you read diagonally from the top left to the bottom right, the entire phrase, what on earth have you done, is constructed in all italics. 
The phrases were drawn by tracing a projection of the words directly onto the wall so that the drawing captures the distortion of the words and letters as they are stretched, becoming elongated according to the curvature of the wall and the alcoves. For example, as a letter in the word on crosses from the, cur the curved edge of the alcove over a right angle onto the wall, it becomes slightly expanded. The use of the architecture creates an optical effect where, from many angles, the words seem to be in correct perspective. Despite the distortions mentioned above, the words are drawn with impeccable consistency, using a matte black paint marker and therefore appear almost like a plastic vinyl, thick and prominent. Because they were drawn by tracing a projected image, the font is incredibly uniform although slight variations from the artist's hand are visible. Are there any questions about this work before we bring Nikki back and kind of have a conversation about it? it it's Sharon. Um, can I ask, so in each line, like it's, what the ne is it the next word, like the first word is italicized and on the next line, it's the second word that's italicized, is that right? And yes. on the third word, third line, it's the third word. word. That's like, is that right? Yep, that's exactly right, Sharon. Okay, so so wait, there's six six words. Is it there's six words and six lines? I'm this should be like easy to count, but um, I don't know. So there's as many lines as there are words. Yes, um, and while you say it's easy to count, for the longest time I kept saying seven lines. So I, and uh, Nikki actually corrected me, but it's six lines for six words. Um, and each line goes in sequence so that the corresponding line number, for example, the third line has the third word italicized. Okay, got it. And is this done, I know you said it, but as a little, is it, it's done by hand or these are, how was it done? So Nikki, why don't you talk a little bit about the process and sort of how you made this work? Sure, yes. Um, thank you for the question, Sharon. Um, this, sure. work, this work um, was inspired by uh, um, an older work that I had made uh, that was, what on earth do you mean? And it was about this, this idea of, uh, of how, how what you see can determine so much of so much subtlety that it's so hard. It's it was ultimately about the difficulty of clear communication, right? And then and then I, I just like the idea of what on earth have you done to be, to be this, this uh, colloquial expression that, that seemed extremely relevant in our time of, uh, climate change, and um, so how did I do it? Logistically, would be that I took that image, the original image of what on earth have you done. And I projected it using a small projector that I could put on a tripod onto the wall and then traced the lines as best I could and then filled them in with an acrylic uh, paint marker. So, um, uh, you know, and I, I had to, I had to be very, um, very careful the whole time. It took about two days. Um, the second day I had a friend helping me out, a fellow artist, Laure Cuvillier, and, um, even with her help, it, it took two, two full days, basically, of just filling in carefully these lines. Um, so that's how it was done. And so the original, the original lettering that you projected, was that you, you lettered it, you hand lettered it? No, the original one was uh, a design that I had made in Adobe Photoshop. So it's based on an actual font. I believe the font is Garamond. And... Uh, I was just playing around with the words. A lot of my work is text text based, so I was I was um, I was playing around with the words kind of as a collage in Photoshop, and I came up with this visual thing that 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 I then cut out of vinyl. So the original piece was actually vinyl text on plexiglass on um, on a like frosted white plexiglass. So it was very much like this without the architectural. Um, background that Wave Hill has, but it was very, very graphic, black letters on white plastic, 
um, and the letters were vinyl, so they were very uniform and crisp. And that's what I tried to emulate in the Wave Hill uh, entryway. Thank you. And so this is site specific, like this will only exist here, is that right? Yes, that's right. And, uh, and actually, um, in the next iteration of this same exhibition uh, at Lehman College Art Gallery, I'll be doing a similar one in their entryway rotunda, but that one will be much bigger, but also site specific. And so it's basically like the same piece that's, that's having different iterations. Um, uh, Gabriel called it an adaptation in the catalog. He said, uh, adapted from a, a work. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting to see how this work has, is changing over time and like kind of growing up, like having its own experience, <laughs> the child. When... Thank you. Thank you. And so Nikki, it's interesting to hear you talk about the original iteration of this work, which was made out of vinyl. And I know that you're trying to also sort of visually replicate the quality of vinyl. Can you talk about the why you didn't? I know that it was an important artistic decision to use um, your sort of a, a more handwritten approach. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think one of the reasons, the, the, the first reason that I decided against vinyl was because of the nature of the show. Um, it's a it's eco urgency. It's about it's about environmental. Um, uh, I don't know environmental degradation, and so one of the big problems facing our environment is plastic, and so I didn't want to make a work for a show about environmental destruction that was made out of plastic and on plastic, you know, which I had done a decade earlier. And um, so I just thought, like, how could I do this in a way that that is that doesn't leave a big footprint, I guess. You know, that was the main the main thinking behind it, because this could have been vinyl, but vinyl is plastic. Yeah, and I think it's interesting to think about what it means as an artist to start to embody really hold on to the sort of content and concepts of the work that you're making. And I appreciate that so much about the way you work, um, which is to not, this is almost like a zero waste project, right? Of course, there's the lost ink, but in terms of um, the amount of material required to produce a work, this is definitely a minimal um, approach to minimizing waste. Um, and I think I so. But I would say that it also highlights the difficulty of doing so because for example this is this is not ink this is acrylic paint and acrylic paint right there in the word in the in the name of it tells mm -hmm. you that that's also plastic ultimately right acrylic um so you know even as i try to get away from from a, a wasteful practice it's just hard and i think that's symbolic of of all of us and of our, our planet we're trying to get away from a destructive practices, but it's really hard. It is really hard, um, but I definitely look to artists like you and other thinkers who are really kind of up for the challenge, you know, and, and make work okay. that's responsible. Um, I'd also like to hear you talk about uh, sort of the phonic qualities of the work. I know that I read it and kind of went through um, trying my best to enunciate properly, Great job. <laughs> um, but if you can also share with us um, why it was important to have a work that had a, a sort of significant um, oral aspect to it. Mm -hmm. um, for that question, I think I have two answers. Uh, one of them is purely about the sound, uh, the quality of sound that happens in the mind of the viewer. Um, so, one is just like this experimental thing that I have been playing with a lot that from, from a book that I read by the neurologist Oliver Sacks. Uh, the book was called uh, Musicophilia. And it's an amazing book for anyone who's interested in, in music and how it functions on a neurological level in, in uh, human beings. And, and one of the interesting things is that imagining sounds uh, as far as your brain is concerned, as far as your auditory cortex is concerned, is exactly the same as hearing sound. 
So in other words, when I make works like this that are kind of sound based, but silent, but you're imagining the different sounds, that's exactly the same for your brain as if, as if, you know, Jesse was reading it or something like that. So that, that's very interesting to me that, that I can kind of, you know, put sound in your mind. And, you know, as an artist, I think that's a very powerful thing. It's same thing as a visual artist who's making images and putting images in your mind. It's a very direct thing, but the sound seems like it's kind of different, but similar. And then the other reason that I wanted it to, to have this, this sound quality and, and almost, almost like an exclamation point at the end, when you read that final sentence of that's a, diagonal and it's all italics I almost want there to be an exclamation point at the end of that one and it's because because that's the urgency right so so yeah this this work is silent in a sense but in another sense it's it's yelling at you you know from within hearing it read aloud does it change the way you think about the work not really. I, the way I think about the work is reading it aloud because you're kind of seeing it aloud, mm. seeing it aloud, which is one of the interesting things for me on a formal level is just this relationship between seeing and hearing, you know. So, yeah, it's the same. Like when you when you read it, that's how people see it. Mm. You know? Yeah, it's an interesting sort of synesthetic overlap or something exactly. like that, where these sensory um, crossovers begin to, right, like seeing produces a sound or something like that. Right. Um, I have more questions for you, Nikki, but I also want to take a moment and kind of open it up to the audience if anybody has questions or sort of comments or reflections that have come up in the last couple of minutes. So I think the next question I'd ask is, I know that you were born in Ecuador and I'm wondering if that experience has influenced the way you see our relationship with nature or if you see a difference in terms of how um, people from Ecuador or South America um, at sort of in a larger um, orientation approach the natural world in a different way. Um, than maybe people from America, right? Like the United States of America. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that I don't, I don't think that it's, I don't think of it personally in terms of a different approach to nature or a different way of seeing nature. It's more like, because I'm a political artist, maybe it's, it's more like a different political relationship to the planet and, and to, and vice versa. It's kind of like, I don't know, I, I think of the vaccine, like you just for some reason made me think of the availability of the COVID-19 vaccine, which in, in America is already on booster shots and countries like Ecuador, a lot of people are still struggling to get their first shot, you know? And so it's kind of like, that is a symbolic, typical uh, example of the political realities of a country in South America, like Ecuador and, and most of the global South. You know, and so, so that's, that's, when it comes to climate change, I feel like that's the real, the real um, difference. Um, it's like, as Greta Thunberg says, uh, climate change is not a, a fair crisis. It's not a fair in quotes. Um, she says, uh, the, the countries that have been creating most of the pollution are not the countries that will be suffering the worst uh, outcomes, consequences of the po pollution. And, um, and we're already seeing that. We've been seeing that for a long time. And actually it's this summer that the first time that we saw um, climate change uh, disasters in Western Europe uh, with uh, cars floating down the street in Germany. And it's like, you know, that's the kind of thing that, that my, my sensibility as an artist who was born in Ecuador with family in Ecuador and, um, and ultimately who considers himself a global citizen, it's like that I noticed that that when cars are floating down India, that's not a that's not seen as a global problem. But when cars are floating down Germany, 
that's a global problem, you know? And so that's the difference that, I'm, that I, I see a lot from, from my perspective as an Ecuadorian American artist. Thank you for that. Um, and it makes me think of a conversation that I had with members of the curatorial team. I think it was either yesterday or two days ago when we were at Maya Lin's Ghost Forest. And um, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's an installation um, by an artist who has installed, I think, 20 trees that are dead um, in a park and they died because of climate change. And one of the conversations that the three of us had, Eileen and Gabriel, who are both on this call right now, was this idea that the climate crisis for so long has been projected into the future, right? Where it was like, oh, this is for a generation after me. This is for two generations after me, maybe even three. But now just as kind of what you're saying, and there's a political, a politic to this, right? Because it's happening in Germany, because even the major deacon is flooding suddenly now in a way that it never was up in the Bronx. Um, the very harsh reality that it is today. It is not tomorrow, it is yesterday. Um, and so within that idea of urgency and the title of the show is Eco Urgency, do you see this um, work and this sort of repetition of what on earth have you done? Is this a call to action? Is this a moment for reflection? Is this a call out? Um, where does that lie? That's a good question. I don't know, I can't speak for the viewer, but but I would be happy for it to be any of those things that you mentioned in, in different viewers. You know, maybe for somebody it's a call to reflection and for someone else it's a call to action. Um, it's definitely about, I guess, in the context of the show, it's definitely about raising awareness about the urgency, right? The eco urgency. And I'm really glad that Wave Hill has done this. I mean, um, you know, Wave Hill is, is historically a place that really celebrates the beauty and majesty and mystery of nature and um, not usually uh, calling out the urgency of the threat to nature. And this is, it's a great, it's great to see that. And I think it's important, um, you know, we're, we are in a moment where it, like you're saying, Jesse, it is today and not tomorrow. And at the same time, what we do today will greatly, greatly impact tomorrow. And that's, that's what, that's why we're here. You know, that's why we're here. Cause this is a, a crucial moment right now there's the cop 26 is happening in glasgow right now and um so far i mean i'm not up on the latest news from like yesterday but but it seems like so far we we have not been up to the challenge and we really need to get up to the challenge and one of the ways that we can get up to the challenge is by really putting this these ideas about eco urgency on the front page you know every day and in in the galleries in every way and just, you know, shouting it from the rooftops, you know. Thank you, Nikki. I wanna also, again, take a moment to open this up to anybody in the audience if they have questions for Nikki, or sort of reflections that have come up. Everyone's feeling shy. I have a question if no, nobody else does. Um, so Nikki, I ha happen to know that you're also a DJ. Uh, so I was wondering, um, cause I, you talked about this a little bit, but I, I also see this, uh, even though it's a text-based piece, I also see it as, as a sound piece in a way. And mm -hmm. I wonder if um, your your practice as a DJ has sort of informed um, this work, and and if so, ha how? Yes, definitely. I mean, uh, I feel like uh, DJing to me is mu much more than just the moment where I'm DJing when I'm actually spinning for a, an event. Uh, it's more like a mindset and a way of approaching audio and and uh, and sharing audio all the time you know the to me the the real job of a dj is to be sharing music um in in many ways not just at a an event and um and then also just this idea of that when you're listening to music when you're when you're a dj listening to music is kind of like the step one of creating music right it's like 
it's like a plant where photosynthesis where your consumption of music becomes is the first step of the production of music and um and so and how that works is because you're you're thinking of the possibility of things and like the the things that people know and how you can play with them you know in a cool way and so that's why this this piece this text you know i didn't invent you know, I didn't write the music of what on earth have you done? That's that's a piece of music that's in our language in English uh, as an expression that everyone has heard a million times. What on earth have you done? So it's 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 that kind of uh, taking something that is pre-existing uh, in the DJ's case music and then manipulating it in some way that it seems newly meaningful in some way or mashing it up or whatever in this case manipulating right manipulating so it's like if this were really a piece of music it's almost like i turn the volume up on the what on earth have you done and then i turn the volume up on on what on earth have you done you know it's like tweaking tweaking the level of the sound piece that's in your head visually <laughs> so it's definitely very related to dj activity you know and just def defamiliarization, you know, the idea that you've heard what on earth have you done, but have you ever actually thought that the earth was at the center of that expression, you know, and how beautiful that is, especially for a, a moment of eco-urgency, how beautiful it is to, that we have an expression that is an expression of shock about what we have done, and earth is at the center of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions for Nikki from the audience? It's Sharon, I was just gonna say that it's so interesting until you just said that, you know, right, earth is in the center of the expression, but I don't think you realize it until you just said it, you know, it's, it's sort of, that's interesting. Yeah, I, just th I think that's the job of, of the artist or the DJ to make you see or make you hear the thing that's right there anyway. <laughs> Right. Right. Hi, Nikki. Mm -hmm. I'm also wondering if you can talk about the 10 hour playlist that you put together on Spotify. Oh, thank you for that, Eileen, because I had written it as a note. Mention eco urgency mix, <laughs> but I'm not looking at my notes. So, um, yeah, in, in conjunction with this show, just naturally, because I'm a DJ, it just started happening that I started to to think about music that actually has a, either that has a climate change as a theme or that could be could be interpreted as such uh, when in the context of this playlist, because a lot of it is context too, right? In the context of the eco urgency show, this work makes a lot more sense than in many other contexts. So, so I made this this mix on Spotify, which is um, public, and um, it's called the Eco Urgency Playlist. And I think Eileen just put it in the chat. Yeah, and it's uh, it's over 10 hours at this point, and it's got, it's just great. Like you can just shuffle it. I suggest if you if anyone's on Spotify, if you're not on Spotify, I suggest you get on Spotify. If you are on Spotify, I suggest you get on Spotify Premium. If you're on Spotify Premium, I suggest that you go into the settings, into the playback settings, and make sure that the crossfade is turned on and set the crossfade to 11 seconds. That will make the end of a song crossfade with the beginning of the next song over 11 seconds. And then shuffle my mix and you're in for a special treat because it's like great mix for listening from, you know, it might inspire you to be dancing. But at the same time, there's an underlying eco urgency message throughout. And every time that you play it and shuffle it, it will be a different experience because it's 10 hours, over 10 hours. So, yes, please check that out. Any closing questions for Nikki before we bring on Leo now? It, it's Sharon, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So do I just go, uh, cause I, I, step one, I am on Spotify. <laughs> that's right. about, yes, so, so do I, if I click on this link, the, if I copy this link from the chat, it will open Spotify and bring me to your, to your playlist. I believe so. Let me try it right now. Okay. I, well, you know, because this is like baby, uh, baby steps. I'm a very low tech girl. 
Yes, no, it's it it is it is working. Um, I just tried it. Oh, and, cool. and, then, and then if you, I think, I don't know. Yeah, it's just it's yeah, it's inspired by this show actually. Oh, that's great. Okay, so I think I'm. I think I may be in it. Okay. In the meantime, I'll copy that link so I have it going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And will it work if you don't have premium? If you I don't, I think it will work, but you might have ads, advertisements interrupting. Uh, which I'm was... highly, I'm very against that. So, you know, know. to me, yeah. premium is is absolutely worth it. You know, just avoid the advertisement. Advertising is just like my piece, but in the in a in a in an evil way in a in a like you know my piece is like front and center here i am as an artist manipulating your brain in a cool way for a good cause the advertisements are here i am manipulating your brain for my bottom line and you know for it's just you know it's worth ten dollars to get rid of that no absolutely i agree with you <laughs> it's a good way of saying saying it though <laughs> thank you well nikki thank you so much for being here with us um and thank you everybody for asking questions uh i think the next step is to uh bring on leonel um who will introduce himself and then we will kind of go through the same process of describing the work um in context in the gallery and then doing a description of the work and we'll repeat this process thank you Hello, good afternoon. Um, thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Gabriel, Irene, and thank you for uh, this invitation and for being part of this panel presentation. Um, my name is Lionel, and I'm a Latino person. I have a short black uh, hair and a short beard as well. I am wearing a gold circular rim glasses and a black button-down shirt with a short neck. And I'm in, a, in an office room that is mostly gray, white. And I'm excited to be here to share with all of you my work and to describe it. Thanks, Lionel. So I've got a new image up on the screen right now. And it was taken at eye level from about 10 feet away from the wall. And this image shows the northernmost wall of Glendor Gallery. And in this image, there are three hanging prints, all cast in a glowing red light, as well as a fireplace, decorative moldings, and wood floors, also cast in red. The wall is not one continuous wall, but instead is three separate spaces delineated by decorative elements, including alcoves and molding. The first third of this image on the left-hand side of the screen shows a recessed alcove where one print hangs at eye level. Separated from the alcove by molding and in the middle of the wall is a black marble fireplace with a mantle. Hanging above the fireplace is another print. To the right of the fireplace is another alcove, identical to the one mentioned earlier where a third print hangs. So before I go into describing one of the three prints, I just wanted to ask if anybody um, has questions sort of about the architectural setting that the work is within. So I'm gonna to move to the next slide. So this is an image of one of the three hanging works. Set within a simple white frame is a rectangular print that is longer than it is wide. The print is 30 by 20 inches and contains an image made of three colors, dark shapes and strong textures. This print is the result of an experimental digital printing process that involves printing an image on a piece of paper, then printing another image on the same piece of paper and repeating this process many times. As a result, this artwork captures many layers of images to play with our perception of scale and perspective. 
there is also a trace of the process visible in the print itself, a series of horizontal lines and hazy textures that are a result of the multiple passes through the digital printer and the deposits of ink. The two most prominent aspects of the print are the intense and visually fuzzy gradient of neon colors that shift from a bright cerulean blue at the top of the image into an almost toxic color purple and then fading into a salmon colored coral as your eye travels down the composition. Obscuring parts of the gradient across the right half and lower third of the image are thick black matte silhouettes of tropical and coastal, and coastal flora, the most recognizable being palm fronds and mangrove leaves. There are areas where the silhouettes are so thick that you cannot see the gradient, but there are some areas where the intensity of the color gradient peeks through. To visualize the palm fronds, imagine a long pointed triangle that has many zigzags cut into its sides, creating an alternating outline <laughs> of faces made from inverted triangles like a jagged line. The mangrove leaves are bean shaped, more oval and softer in form. So that was a lot. So I want to give a moment to pause and let that sink in or ask anybody if they need clarification on sort of that first description. If you look closer into the background of the print, more details begin to emerge. The fuzzy textures mentioned earlier in the description are partly from an image of sand taken from above, that after multiple processes of printing appear like an abstract texture rather than a clear image of the material itself. It is granular, fuzzy, and hazy with variants of shadow and light because sand is not a smooth surface, but instead contains dimples, holes, and grains of different sizes. The graininess of the image and the gradient of color almost makes the sand look like a Martian or extraterrestrial landscape. Resting on top of the sand is the faint image of a white bottle cap, still attached to a clear and dented plastic two liter bottle of soda or seltzer. Within the image itself, the bottle is larger than the palm fronds or leaves and is at times partially obscured or hidden by the black matte silhouettes of the plants. Are there any questions about that description or places that we can offer more clarity? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, I was curious, is this your description or is this the artist's description? That's a great question. Um, so the process for this program is where I write a draft of a description and then work with each artist to kind of fill in the blanks that I may have missed or add a certain level um, of clarity. Um, for example, in this one, in, in Leonella, I'm gonna also pass this to you in a moment to kind of talk about this process, um, was I know that texture was super important to Leonel, so that was something that I um, kept in mind. Um, and in general, there's a interesting question of the politics of description, because mm -hmm. I am, and we are describing something here, um, and it's always a sensitive moment of what do you share, what doesn't get shared, and sort of what are the political and but the actual implications of that. Um, and I'm not sure. I don't have all those answers, but through these programs, hoping to to understand it better. Wow. Yeah, I love the description style. It's very like a. I mean, even the way the artist introduced himself, it was. 
I mean, you just assume that you experience the same thing as everyone else, but then you describe it and you're like, oh, this is a different way of like entering the landscape and just how to experience it. So it's, 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 it's cool. It's like rich and layered and it's like another level of like painting the landscape. It's gorgeous. Thanks, Johnny. I really appreciate that. And I'm glad to see you here also. Mm -hmm. Lionel, do you want to talk a little bit about this process of building a description of this work? I think it was 100% uh, collaborative. I think you had some perspective on how you wanted to be able to compose a description that goes uh, deeper into, into the artwork. I think sometimes we always rely on the visual components and we assume that you know, everyone understands what they are seeing. And I think this exercise was really interesting to start um, uh, decomposing an image or sort of like uh, setting it uh, or, or, or observing it and studying it in different parts and see how can that be described. So I think, um, yeah, to respond to the question, uh, Shanti, thank you so much. It was, it was a collaboration. So um, with Jesse's expertise and also some of the descriptions that the artwork uh, had already previous to, um, to the exhibition and some, of, some, some ideas about the process also was merged into this description. Wonderful. So Lionel, the title of this work is Dusk Daybreak. And I would love to hear you talk about that title and how it relates to the gradient of blue into orange that I described. Yes, so absolutely. The title of, the, of that work and the entire series, because it's six different um, artworks, they are all titled Dusk, Daybreak. And I, the decision on that title was about this moments of, of, of transition that, uh, you know, that happen and that we are able to observe from Earth. So as the Earth rotates right around the world, uh, there are different effects that we see of light that goes through. And especially during the dusk or the moment of daybreak, or you know the morning and the early evening, we see these transitions of light that goes into into different fades, and we can see it in the sky um, where we see multiple tones, more than two, three tones, where we see the brighter light of the sun mixed with um, some of the atmospheric components, and also into the darker, into the blue, and to a darker blue. So I thought about bringing some of that um, visual experience into, into the artwork as a way to compensate for this, this moments of transition. So the, what you're seeing here, that all of the series of prints are different ways of capturing these moments of light transition where it's not yet one tone, not another, not fully bright, but not fully obscure. Thank you. And so where, because in the description, I had talked about sand, palm trees, mangroves, a plastic bottle. Can you talk about where these images are from? How many, would you take them with a, pho with a phone or a camera? Are these sourced online? Kind of give us that, that sort of um, picture. Yes. So all of the images that you're describing that are part of the work, so when we see the work in front of us or when we are experiencing the work there, um, you will see an image that is completely layered. And all of those are uh, photographs that I have taken, digital photographs that I have taken in various times as I do walks or um, around the beach, uh, specifically uh, in Puerto Rico. And there's definitely a layer of a, of, a, of a digital picture that I took of sand um, and that is turned into black and white. Uh, so it's reduced of all of the pigments and printed. And the second layer was just a, um, a bottle, a plastic bottle laying on the sand. And I took a picture of that and also print, turned it into black and white and printed and then took that same print already with those two images and put it again back into the printer 
and use another um, image. And those images came out at, um, from an archive that I have been creating uh, for many years already of multiple digital uh, um, pictures that I keep organizing in this archive in different categories of things that I keep exploring uh, as, I, as I go through these walks. So that's the original source of this, of this material. So what you're seeing is a landscape that is composed of multiple places and multiple perspectives all into one. And I'm always so interested in the creative process in general of artists. I think that's so fascinating. And so when I hear you say that you've been sort of cataloging images for a long time, did you know in the beginning when you started gathering this material that you were like, I'm gonna make this sort of psychedelic layered experimental print, or is that something that comes after when you've gathered enough material and it kind of can coalesce in a, in a different way? I think it happens. It happened after, definitely. But I think as as I'm growing and as I keep continuing researching, reading, and exploring and observing things, uh, some of that, some of those ideas, like start um, developing. So at the moment, like perhaps when I took the the um, the picture of the of the plastic bottle, I wasn't thinking that it was going to turn into something like this, perhaps, but um, just that is the importance of having an organized archive of images, of images that I believe are important to be able to keep within this uh, within this this uh, archive. But no, it wasn't supposed to be like this from the very beginning. I wasn't so determined when it came to that. Yeah. So who knows? Probably from that archive will emerge some other future artworks. <laughs> I certainly can't wait to keep abreast on how you use that archive. I actually want to talk a little bit about the, the plastic bottle because it's in a way quite subtle in the image, but once you see it, it's impossible to ignore. Like it's, you cannot unsee it to use sort of a, a term. And I'm also curious about the scale of it because it, it takes up almost maybe a quarter or a third of the composition, um, where does scale come into this in terms of image um, processing and making? Yes, well, it was a photograph that I took very close to the to the to this to this bottle, uh, specifically because it was filled with water from the ocean. Because I took it as I was doing this walks along the beach, so and I I was very curious because the the bottle was filled with water, but it had a, its bottle cap. So that's why I precisely took this image because it was so probably um, confusing or ironic. Uh, it was also something I was curious about how all of this water like filled this bottle. But from there, I started researching because um, of course in, in 2017, there was a study that came out that um, close to 1.6 million of plastics were found um, in the oceans and most of them were beverages, uh, beverage bottles. And this number keeps increasing uh, every year. And I, that created, that created a, um, an impact on, on, on me, of course, uh, precisely because we are, we are changing in a way and transforming this landscape that we're familiar with uh, precisely with materials that don't decompose or don't turn into something else, or that it will take more than a lifetime to be able to, um, to, to, to transform or to decompose. And from there, that's how it started. The decision on making this on such a bigger scale into the artwork that it takes a big portion of it was precisely because of that, right? Like um, plastic bottles and, 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 and bottles in general are very small. And if you see a landscape against this scale relation, sometimes they almost disappear into the landscape. I was trying to bring that into, into, into the ways that we observe, right? Into the ways that we understand a landscape that sometimes these things that are small are becoming bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. It's, that's a beautiful, 
way of talking about it and it's so effective um, because it you cannot look at this image without the sort of presence of that plastic. Um, and it also makes me think about sort of the, there's a quality to the color where it's almost like venomous, right? Like it's, it's such an intense blue, it's such an intense pink, it's such an intense orange and nature has a way of sort of signaling danger through that type of color. Um, and again, not, not, to, not to beat a dead horse in a sense, but we are talking about grave ecological, a grave ecological crisis, right? From pollution to climate change. Um, and it's, I really see it all in here. Um, I have some more questions for Lionel, but I wanna open it up to the audience if there are any questions about the description or reflections that have come up I have a question. Um, uh, I'm just wondering, you know, I'm thinking back to uh, Gabriel's question about the relationship between my DJing and, and my piece. And I, and I can see that Lionel's piece and his process are also similar in a sense of uh, like your archive, Lionel, right? This is like a crate of records that you can sort through and be like, aha, this one, you know? And then, and you're like, th this is almost like a mashup of these different samples, you know? So I, I just wondered, are you also a DJ? <laughs> I enjoy music. I wish I will know how to DJ and how to be able to remix things on real time. I consider myself an aficionado or as a hobby um, doing DJing actually. So yeah, which is the visual part of remixing images video projections that are synchronized with sounds <laughs> cool and so Lionel, i have a question about the red light that we had mentioned um earlier that kind of casts over these prints and to just build a little more context around it um in a gallery you light the artwork in general it's usually with a sort of fluorescent or a spotlight that's anywhere from mm, a soft off-white color to something that's a little more yellow. I mean, it really depends on the lighting infrastructure of the gallery, but um, you've shown this work with a red light, and so we wanted to honor that. Where does that come from? What does that do for you optically when you look at this work? And it would just be great to hear about that. Yes, so the red light has always been a question um, for the most recent works uh, that I have done in terms of how they get installed into the galleries or in museum spaces. And it is, it is, a, it is a decision that I have taken that has multiple, multiple, multiple purposes. So the first one is um, one of the points of reference that I want to, to start is that um, so the decision on, on, on presenting this red color comes from the re references um, and uh, safety measurements that um, environmentalists have put out in protection for, uh, for sea turtles in coastal communities. So they use uh, the resources of red lights next to places that are, uh, or communities that are next to the, to the sea or to the ocean. Um, Particularly because the red light has a lower um, has a lower wavelength, so there's certain animals that are not so receptive of that light as it will be for white. Um, so I wanted to bring that into the discussion because for us uh, the meaning or the or the or seeing in a space filled with red light means something different. It has a it 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 it. it connects to signals and to symbols of danger, perhaps, or to be in, a, in an endangered space. But uh, it, is, it is a measurement that is being used on some of these spaces. I also think it creates a different quality in the, in the chromatics of the work. So the way that we see color, it's completely transformed. So if you take all of those six artworks or the ones that are on the image right now that we see the three uh, side by side or only one, if you see them, um, outside of that red uh, light or that red glow, they will look completely different. So the, the, the chromatics of the color change. 
Yeah, and that was a that was a, a careful decision that we took as well. <laughs> and so I, I'm curious, what does that mean as an artist to, for you to have moments where the work looks so drastically different um, when sometimes it's shown in white light, sometimes it's shown in red light. Um, what does that mean for you to have that sort of skewing of perception? Is that about reality not being real? Is that about what is that about? I think it's I think it's a way to um, to anchor the works and to also have an attention focus into it. Um, precisely, which is what happens to some of this some of these coastal small communities um, that live in areas that are like nesting zones for sea turtles. Um, I mean, it's, it's there's such an aggressive um, um, plan to be able to change the lining of the scenarios or to shut the lights for some periods during the year where um, sea turtles come uh, to the sand to be able to lay their eggs for their for the future of their of their species and but it creates a very intense um, image in those spaces so I think I wanted to be able to um, emulate that or to have a dialogue with that into the gallery into the gallery space or the exhibition space because it definitely make you see in a space in a different way and it makes you stop or question what's happening um, mm. in the surrounding space, yes. And I really appreciate that as a viewer because on the one hand, the prints sort of talk about kind of the precarious moment we're in, right? And the dangers of our ecological moment. But then on the other hand, you're presenting this kind of very, um, generous and sincere gesture that humans are doing to try and create a moment of like interspecies care, right? Or um, interspecies collaboration where we're changing our lighting infrastructure to accommodate um, a non-human species, which um, feels like in some way a remedy to climate change or to the sort of Anthropocene thinking, right? Where humans are the main focus. Um, So yeah, no question there, just a reflection. Um, I'm wondering if there are questions from the audience um, for Lionel. I have another reflection that I just thought of. Um, I, the red light, when you were talking about the red light, it reminded me of, th this is crazy, but when I was in Amsterdam like 20 years ago and in the red light district, and it was like insane because they the law was that you could that prostitution was legal if you had a red light in your window, which in in the lawmaker's mind was like a little red light in in the window, like a candle or light or whatever. But in the, you know, in the pushing that law to the extreme mind, what it meant was big shop windows, bathed in red light, with uh, women in the windows selling sex, right? And so in a way, this is like it looks it reminds me of that it's like red light district and the what well, and here the natural beauties that we're selling off to the highest bidder are our our own nature you know like mm. pimping out nature And so Lionel, I'm gonna ask a question that I also asked Nikki, which is how has your time in Puerto Rico, um, which is an island, you know, and has a very sort of um, specific ecology and situation in terms of, you know, being so close to the coast, um, how has that framed or shaped your approach to art making and also your sensitivity um, to sort of ecological um, moments? or the ecology around you? Yes, I think, I think in order for me to be able to articulate some of this, some of this concerns and some of this research that I have been doing and some of the formats of the exhibitions that I have been doing, you know, uh, during my career, I think this, this, this has been what uh, this has happened with a lot of introspection and being able to um, look at all of the work that I have been doing seeing all of the products and the drawings and the resources that I have had since very early stages in order to arrive into here. So it has been a lot of um, introspection and a lot of observation, 
setting back and looking at my entire uh, practice and development of my artwork and being able to see that there are there is a very recurrent um, theme and there's a very recurrent preoccupation that is weaved through um, through all of this artworks. And as I tell people, I see all of my artworks like chapters of a, of a, of a larger story that keeps building onto each other. And there is a, a diverse range of mediums with a preference with audiovisual materials, um, experimental prints such as this one, and um, in a various practices, but all of them with a focus to present this, this um, to present something under under the same umbrella or the same of the same topic. But that took time to be able to observe that and to see that there has been a thread um, of interest during during along my career. And so if you could or sort of encapsulate what that thread is, what is that for you? Yes. So, and to respond to continue with the question in terms of like Puerto Rico, I think perhaps just being that setting in that scenario, um, that can definitely indicate some inclinations and some ideas that I have that has been forming within me because I artists are um, a response to everything that surrounds them. And uh, definitely understanding that I lived in a place that, that is an island. And when I knew that when I was when I was very young at a young age, knowing that the beach that I enjoyed so much was the edge or the last point of, of firm land that, the, that, that was available for me in that space that created a very, um, a very intense uh, perspective about my surroundings and about who I was and who I am still and my relationship to, to the geography of the entire world that surrounds us and to even the, the landscape that is in, in, in my proximity. So I think that is something that, um, that has been building up. Yeah, and if you can repeat that second question, I'll appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and thank you for going another level deeper with, with that. Um, the question was, because you had mentioned that you see your work as sort of chapters in a story, right? And as you've been making, you've seen what that thread is. And I would just love to hear from you, what, what is that thread? What is this sort of narrative or arc that you're working within? I think it is a mystery and I will let that to the people that experience my work in all different senses. I think um, if you have the opportunity to go and to see um, my artwork, definitely, go and, and, and be part of it. Um, I'm a very welcoming person to all different types of sensorial experiences that one can have. But there is definitely like three key uh, um, um, thematic uh, or conceptual like frameworks that I, that I present through my work. And one of them is this geopolitical relations that we have with, with, with land and with what belongs from where we belong and and in this relationship with land uh, and with geographies. The second one and the second kind of like framework is um, this conceptions of ecology. I think um, ecology is a very is a very uh, controversial area of study because we all come from different backgrounds and from different perspective about what um, and what a different morale of what is good and what's not and our, our different relations to 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 the environment that surrounds us. So I think that is something that I'm 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 definitely interested. And the last one is this concepts and this connections with technology. We live, as I mentioned, in a in a post digital era already. Um, and and that definitely shapes the way that we understand things, that we understand our surroundings, and that we understand our relation with the with other um, organisms that surround us. Mm. So those are three key uh, um, themes that I explore through my work. You definitely do. Um, and I see kind of all of that touched on in, in this work in, in some way. So I want, we're approaching kind of the end um, of our program. We've got about 15 minutes left. So I really wanna make some space um, for the audience if there are reflections um, or questions about this work um, or even about the program at, at large. Eileen, I was wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more on the other works in the series. I think there's five more and how that 
um, what was your thought process um, with those works and are any of those imageries in, that occur in the first work um, duplicated in the others? I'm just curious. Yes, so the six of them, um, thank you for the question. The six of them are, are the six artworks are related. Um, they are not the same images, but they're part of the same series. They go together, imagine it like a family. And they all have different uh, textures, different images, and different forms of representation of spaces. Um, and the, behind each of the artworks, there is some key themes that I was exploring, and that's how this, the layered images are composed. So, um, and when I mean layered images is that from this six artworks, one of them can have, um, I will say like six or, or eight different images printed on top of each other. So we're talking about like, they are very um, deep, they're deep artworks. Um, and the key themes, the one that we, that we saw here was, um, as I call it, it was, a, it was a case study for pollution and marine debris. There is another one that is uh, a case for light, time, and the space. The other one was a case study for uh, horizons and points of view. The one on the center in here that you see on the image is uh, a case for the red lights, media, and the artifice. And the last one was a case for e-waste and technofossils. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the last one, I'm sorry, that, that was not, that was the previous, okay. And the last one was a case for sweeping and new ecologies. And that's why there's an old broom that I, uh, that I use on the, on the layer of the, of the, of the image. Mm -hmm. And to sort of follow up with that, that question, Eileen, I think I'm wondering how, when you say, for example, um, e-waste, right? Like how is that reflected as opposed to um, in the image we had talked about with the plastic bottle? I'm sorry, can you repeat it again? Yeah, so um, in, in response to Eileen's question where you kind of just walked us through the sort of different mini components or chapters even within this series, right? There's pollution, um, there was new ecologies, there was e-waste. And so um, we don't have an image of it, but I would love to hear you talk about how e-waste is represented and how that's a different, literally a different image than the one for pollution. Yes, so um, that that is one of the images that we're seeing here. So it will be towards the right in one of the, um, if we're looking at the artwork, to the front is the one on the on the right. And that is the carcass or the shape of a TV, of an old TV, that it was also, um, um, the picture was taken as I was walking through the beach. And this TV has been turned apart. And one of the interesting things about e-waste is that in the recent years, we have had um, a complete success with the development of like new technologies and this digital revolution that I that, that that has happened but definitely has created multiple devices and those devices of course are um are are used for a short amount of time and later disposed because there's always upgraded versions of it. and that is becoming part of our of the geography of our planet if, if one thing's in the last like 20 years that has been um like innumerable amounts of, of, of computers perhaps, or monitors and TVs and this and that. And that's only mentioning things that can project images. And one can think about even phones and some other devices. And they are great because they facilitate many things for us, but then where do they go after? And um, one, of the, one of the images is a recording of this carcass, as I call it, of this TV that was found in the beach. Mm -hmm. and so, so all and of so, them are different case studies for, for different preoccupations in regards to these concepts around ecology. Well, and it, it makes me think hearing you talk about it, what Nikki was also saying about sort of the global South and how that experience of climate change has been much more acute and much more present to the point where like you've encountered televisions 
washing up on on your beach, right? Like walking around like the island that you call home, there is just trash. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there's plenty of documentaries talking about this. And I think it is something larger than just uh, like, um, just larger than, 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 than what we think. It is a global concern and it's a it's a it's an international like uh, consensus that we have to get with how we want to manage um, many parts of uh, of our of our um, of our decisions. So that is something that is something that is to 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 wait right and to see what's gonna what's gonna happen and perhaps like be more thoughtful about how we do things and so on. It's a tall task, but I really believe that the work of, you know, thinkers and of course politicians is is key. But same with artists, um, really, like you and Nikki taking the time to make this work, to show it to people, to organize conversations around it, and kind of be building out these um, these sort of networks and moments where we can have objects to discuss this around. Because sometimes these these topics feel so large, right? That they're paralyzing, but I find art to be so powerful because it gives me a thing to refer to that we can start to talk through this stuff. Um, I just love artists so much. I'm gonna gush, but I really do. Um, you know, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, so I do wanna, you know, sort of throw out another opportunity for questions from the audience. And if not, I'm gonna pass it to uh, Gabriel de Guzman, who's our director of arts. Going once, going twice. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jesse and Lionel and Nikki. Uh, that was a really wonderful program and um, just a, a really a fascinating deep dive into into your work and and um, really you know so sort of opened my eyes to um, looking more deeply at uh, at your practice and your process. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, I wanted to um, mention that we do have a couple more programs coming up. Um, on Saturday, actually, of, of this coming Saturday, um, November 6th at 2 p.m., we do have uh, an in-person artist talk in the Sunroom project space um, in uh, Glendor Gallery here at Wave Hill. Um, Priscilla Aylman will be uh, speaking about her installation, her site-specific installation in the Sunroom, um, and that will be led by uh, that discussion will be led by Eileen Jeng Lynch. Um, so I hope you will come in and join us for that. And then um, we have one more program uh, for the Eco Urgency exhibition, which will take place on the, um, the, the last weekend of the show um, on Saturday, December 4th um, at to, from 2 to 3.30 p.m., we will have um, uh, gallery talks uh, or artist talks in the gallery itself. It will also be in person. And um, let's see, six of the artists in the exhibition will be there um, to tell you more about, about the work that they have on view. Um, those artists are Hannah Chalou, Richard Ibke, and Mary Lou Lemons. Candice Thompson, Natalie Collette Wood, and Susan Rowe Harrison uh, will all be there um, to, to talk about their work. And um, Eileen and I, and uh, one of the other co-curators, uh, Bartholomew Bland, who is um, the director of Lehman College Art Gallery will also be present um, to, to lead us on the walkthrough of, of the exhibition. So I really hope that you'll all join us for that. Um, we're very excited um, about this show and we're very excited to hear, to have you hear more from the artists about their work.
thank you so much, Gabriel. And thank you to Eileen for being on the back end and the introduction. Thank you, Leonel and Nikki for participating in this whole process. And um, to the audience who's here, um, thank you all.